My name is Elizabeth Yale. Uh, I teach the history of the book at the University of Iowa, and I'm the vice president of the Society of Fellows in Critical Bibliography at Rare Book School. Um, and on behalf of the Society of Fellows and on behalf of Rare Book School, I want to welcome you all to this presentation today, this conversation that we're having um, to celebrate the publication of a great new book um, that is relevant to the history of the book, to uh, history of art scholarship and critical bibliography. Um, our conversation today is Fluxus Forms, author Natalie Heron in conversation with um, Elizabeth Eager, on scores, multiples, and the eternal network. And we're gonna be celebrating the publication of Natalie's book, Fluxus Forms, Scores, Multiples, and the Eternal Network. Um, and I wanna thank uh, the staff at Rare Book School as well for uh, helping us to get this recording going and to set up our session. So thank you very much. And thank you to our speakers as well um, for participating today. I'll introduce our speakers today and then I will turn it over to them. We'll have about 40 minutes of conversation between Elizabeth and Natalie, and then we'll open it up to questions and broader discussion. Um, and about kind of in the last 25 minutes or so, um, we'll open up the chat so that you can post your questions in the chat and your comments in the chat, and then we'll continue the conversation with your questions and comments. So Natalie Heron, is a scholar of modern and contemporary art history and theory with a particular focus on the experimental interdisciplinary practices after 1960. Her research interests include fluxus and the 20th century avant-garde, intersections between visual art and music, sound, listening, experimental scores and notations, works on paper, conceptual art and performance, materiality and ephemerality, contemporary conservation, theories of appropriation, and feminist art and theory related to labor, care, and aging. And of course, Heron is the author of Fluxus Forms, Scores, Multiples, and the Eternal Network, which we're celebrating today, which also was the winner of a Terra Foundation for American Art International Publication Grant. And Heron also is a junior fellow in the Andrew W. Mellon Society of Fellows Critical Bibliography. Elizabeth Eager, who she'll be in conversation with today about her new book, is an assistant professor of art history at the Meadows School of the Arts at Southern Methodist University. Bacon Eager earned her BA in architecture from Yale University, her M. Arch from the Harvard Graduate School of Design, and her PhD in the history of art and architecture from Harvard University. She specializes in the transatlantic history of 18th and 19th century art and material culture with a focus on intersections between art, science, and technology. Her current book project brings together images and objects from both the fine and the mechanical arts to consider the relationship between drawing, the body, and the production of technical knowledge in early America's industrializing society. And with that, I just have to say that it's a beautiful book, Natalie, um, and I'm really looking forward to hearing you and Elizabeth say a little bit more about it today um, and to beginning the conversation. So Elizabeth, I'll pass it on to you. Thank you, Beth. Um... So my thanks also to RBS and to the Society Fellows and to Natalie uh, for the chance to spend some time with this really rich and rewarding and thought provoking book. Uh, it was a pleasure to read and I hope many of you uh, have a chance to read it. If you have not already, I highly recommend you run out or log on to your nearest independent bookstore uh, and purchase it immediately. Uh, from its first line, Fluxus began with a drip Fluxus Forms is both, I think, an engaging read and a sophisticated analysis of a compelling problem. What do we do with the objects of non-objective art? The book takes the reader from the movement's origins in the compositional strategies of avant-garde music and abstract expressionist painting of the post-war period through its heyday in the 60s and decline in the 70s and uh, up to our own contemporary moment and historians retrospective view of its role in seeding contemporary practices of conceptual and performance art. Uh, but Natalie has taken a somewhat perverse approach to that history, if you'll <laughs> uh, pardon the, the phrase, but um, she focuses not on Fluxus's anarchist tendencies or its collectivist approach to authorship the way so many authors have done before her. Instead, she focuses on the form and materiality of the objects that Fluxus used to produce its ephemeral events. These diagrams, texts, and assemblages are the material remains of this ephemeral practice and have remained understudied in the literature uh, on this period and on this movement in particular. 
And I find her work to be particularly instructive for those of us interested in the material text. Uh, the artists and objects she analyzes test the limits of the relationship between material form and authorial act. And I'm really excited uh, to dig into some of these objects that she talks about and get her to un unpack them for us today. Um, so I wanna give Natalie a chance to discuss her own ambitions for the project. And then I thought we would take a kind of deep dive into several of the, the key objects that animate her argument. And she's going to expound on them for us. And hopefully we'll find some uh, correspondences between her work and my work to talk about. And, uh, but I think just to get started, I wonder, Natalie, if you can just talk a little bit about the origin of the project, kind of get us oriented and uh, how it started out, what it has become. Sure, happy to. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. That was very kind. And I'm so excited to be in conversation with you in particular. Um, we're both in Texas, but we both work around the diagram. And I think that's something that we'll get a chance to get into today. So I'm gonna share my screen. Um, the University of Chicago Press, which published the book, was kind enough to offer a 20% off discount code for this event, and it's good through March 31st, um, flux 20 if you go through the press itself. Can everybody see my screen that I'm attempting to share? Good. Okay, great. Thanks. All right. Um, so I guess it helps to start with uh, just some basics um, about what Fluxus is. Uh, nominally, it is an international collective of artists founded in 1962 and is sort of notoriously a difficult movement to describe briefly. Um, but as a way of doing so, I will just say that they were interested in everything that wasn't painting and sculpture in this uh, kind of late modernist moment. They were interested in performance, they were interested in poetry, they were interested in text, they were interested in books. Um, and many of the artists um, still remain underknown, um, although um, Yoko Ono might be the best known among them. This is an array of the artists that I do touch upon in the book, among many, many others, George Machunas, uh, was a uh, co-founder, a major figure within Fluxus. George Brecht and Robert Filiou are also major figures that appear, um, but all the ones pictured um, do as, as well. Dick Higgins, Allison Knowles, Benjamin Patterson, Daniel Spurry, Wolf Fostel, Nam June Paik. Um, and one of the major founding events was a concert series that they launched in Wiesbaden, West Germany in 1962. These were the first publicly named Fluxus concerts. And what I love about these events, um, some photographs you can see here, are that it immediately kind of sets the terms of Fluxus's intermedial existence. So this was a concert of the newest music as the title proposed. And uh, it took place, however, it was sort of a, a kind of avant-garde music concert that took place in a lecture hall in a museum. So already you have a mapping of the fine arts um, and music together. Um, it was received uh, um, in a mixed way. So this image on the left I'm showing you was the advertising poster that was um, wheat pasted around Wiesbaden. And you can see somebody scratched on it, die Irren sind los, which basically means the crazies are loose. And there's a wonderful five minute uh, German newsreel that you can find on YouTube narrated um, in German that shows you primary footage of the Fluxus performances happening. I'm not going to show it, but I really encourage um, you to watch it. It's fantastic. Um, so one of the reasons I got really interested in Fluxus is because first of all, it is often name dropped within contemporary art history as a crucial origin, a kind of crux between modernism, high modernism, modernism of the mid 20th century and the origin of contemporary art as we know it, um, which is much more intermedial about mixing media, about creating new media, about inviting participation, emphasizing conceptual qualities of the work of all art, all of these things you actually see within Fluxus. So it gets name dropped a lot in art history. And yet I didn't feel like there was a really um, a satisfying account that really helped us understand the role of objects within the movement. Um, and this may be because the artists themselves seem to procl proclaim themselves as anti-art 
anti-object. And that was the kind of mythology around Fluxus that has been passed down to us. And when I um, first started researching the movement through archives at the Getty Research Institute, the Gene Brown papers, among many other interrelated archives, I became fascinated by the materiality that these artists were making a lot of stuff, even though they proclaimed themselves to be anti art, anti object as part of a larger ethos of kind of um, anti elitism and a desire to democratize the art field and make art something that we could all make that we could all have that we could have as part of our everyday lives. Um, so I wanted to to offer my perspective on you know what are the objects of fluxus, how are they made, what are their intellectual origins, um, what is their materiality, um, textually speaking, and also very materially speaking. Um, the two main fluxus forms or formats, as I call them in the book, are the event score. Um, an example of which you see on the left by George Brecht, a kind of performance instruction, a recipe for an act, or a prompt to observe something that's already happening in your environment. Um, so the event score is one format. Another is the flux box multiple, which is related to the event score, of course, because the multiple initially was a kind of container to distribute the Fluxus event scores and would often also contain props and little gugas and thingamajigs that you could use in order to enact the Fluxus um, score. So I'm just gonna read uh, one quick paragraph from the introduction, um, which lays out uh, the really broad stroke stakes of the book. Um, this book explores the fate of the artwork in Fluxus as the collective's members abandon modernist aesthetics and ontologies premised on the work of art being a unique single authored object. Instead, through the formats of the event score, the multiple or flux box, and a network of artist run flux shops, Fluxus promoted a notation based model of artistic practice invested in the collaborative authorship of works that could appear in multiple versions across multiple mediums. Fluxus artists scripted scores for everyday actions and constructed assemblages of quotidian objects with which audiences were invited to interact. Informed by the iterative structure of music and the processual quality of certain veins of mid 20th century abstract painting, Fluxus's collectively produced artworks were made from the dross of everyday life and maintained a shifting transmutable material status. This radical object model of the artwork in flux proposed to transform conventions of artistic objecthood and value and practically ensured Fluxus's marginalization, at least in the art world of its time. The artwork in Flux was a complex marriage of conceptual form with concrete materiality. It reconfigured not only the artwork as a material entity, but also artistic authorship, labor, and the systems of arts distribution in ways that have been carried forth by later generations of artists and which now can be appreciated as prescient for their time. Um, to emblematize this artwork in flux, in the very beginning of the book, I start with George Brecht's strip music. Um, so this will be familiar to those of you um, who read the pre-circulated chapters. I'm just gonna read you the first paragraph of the book to kind of set the mood. <laughs> um, so as Elizabeth said, the book does begin with a drip. Um, let me begin, Fluxus began with a drip. Or rather, it began with several drips, as a drip seldom appears alone. A drip most often comes as part of a series of drips, drip, drip, dripping on in their incessant way. This book begins with a work by George Brecht, Drip Music, Drip Event, among a genre of performance instructions referred to by the artist as event scores. It seems to be a simple and direct text. The wording and layout are precise in their minimalism, the primary incident being the transmission of water from one container to another. As a model fluxus work, and more particularly a model fluxus event score, Drip Music's wording is precisely imprecise, as ambiguous as possible, a condensation of text designed to open out meaning to the widest range of interpretations. The performance of the work can be single or multiple. There may be multiple drips, multiple water sources, multiple vessels, or multiple performers. In addition, the language of objects employed here, source, vessel, is neutral, but strikingly vague. As if Brecht's choice of language was not reduced enough, a second version written into the score prescribes simply 
dripping. Um, and then from there, I catalog an array of versions of how this score was realized, drawing attention to uh, the kind of shifting cast of performers, sometimes solo, sometimes multiple, the shifting props used from uh, tea kettles um, to teacups, pie pans, ladders, um, eyedroppers, and then object-based versions where the work becomes a kind of performative sculpture or a sculpture that performs. And then acknowledging the openness of the score also kind of sets a precedent for other artists um, to think about drips and uh, to think about interpretations of scores that really stretch, that kind of stretch the bounds of what we think they might mean. So um, Nam June Paik performing Lamont Young's score, Draw a Straight Line and Follow It in that first uh, V-Spot and Fluxus Festival was so uh, kind of radical uh, and so singular that it actually came to be known by its own title, Zen for Head. This, this uh, kind of iterativity and variability of the scores was really interesting to me. Um, so Drip Music was a score that Brecht wrote among dozens of others that Machunis, as the lead Fluxus publisher, uh, compiled and released in this matchbook-like compilation called Water Yam, another evocation of flux and flow. And of course, the name fluxus is drawn from that Latin flux, which means change. Um, and um, the beginning of the book, um, if I move into a sort of um, rapid fire overview of the chapters um, and beginning to be in more conversation with Elizabeth, um, begins by really interrogating this, this idea of the score itself. There has been great scholarship about the textuality of these scores and their uh, and how they acted as an origin point or a kind of pre-origin point for conceptual art to come later in the 1960s. But I was really interested in um, kind of looking more closely at the context of um, the musical context for the emergence of these pieces. So George Brecht, Alan Caprow, a kind of Fluxus affiliate, and many other Fluxus people passed through the uh, classroom of the experimental composer John Cage at a time when John Cage was really uh, rethinking music along every uh, metric. And this involved writing scores that moved away from staff notation and involved textual instructions. But, you know, I, as an art historian, became really interested in the really graphic visual qualities of a lot of these notations that exist under this um, rubric of graphic notation, as they're typically known. I was really interested in looking at these works as sketches, as drawings, and really as diagrams, as pictures. Um, and this helped me to think about how Fluxus artists, many of whom are coming out of a visual arts context, could um, sort of absorb ideas about music making and ontologies of music that rely on iteration and collaborative authorship and import those into the realm of the visual arts through the event score. Um, so in the book, I talk about a number of these uh, diagram-like scores that Cage, Earl Brown, and Morton Feldman uh, wrote or drew in the 1950s, including this uh, sketch for a series that would eventually be called Projections by Morton Feldman that was um, hidden in the David Tudor papers in the Getty Research Institute. Um, and I was also very excited to be able to reproduce in the book uh, thanks to the Earl Brown Foundation, the original drawing that Earl Brown did uh, for his very famous score, December 1952, which is this abstract array of randomly um, uh, derived um, lengths and widths of kind of pictorial integers that are meant to be read um, as a kind of duration and pitch uh, by the performer. Um, and related to this uh, was uh, John Cage's um, very radical variation series where he literally deconstructed the staff into a series of uh, lines and points and made, made a whole uh, series of scores under the title variations 
where this, the points and the lines are printed on transparencies and the interpreter is meant to uh, overlay the transparencies and then make a series of me measurements that according to Cage's textual instructions would eventually churn out a set of tones that um, could be performed. And here I want to acknowledge how wonderful it is to have artist friends. Um, these were, as you can imagine, very difficult to integrate into a book format to photograph <laughs> these piles of transparency. So um, thanks to my friend and the great artist Kelly Kleinschrott, she was able to help me like figure out a way to image these um, for the book that would communicate in some manner, the materiality of this transparency format, which as you can see from the um, color photographs um, now have become quite yellowed in the archives. Um, but I, at this point, I wanted to invite um, Elizabeth to kind of help me think about the diagram in a kind of larger historical context. Yeah, I was particularly interested in this, um, in the variations by Cage because of the way it um, just, through visual similarity reminded me of so much of the material I work on. Uh, so what we're looking at here is in the upper left, uh, um, this, a mapping exercise uh, from a West Point cadet in the early 19th century and on the right, a projective ge geometry um, assignment uh, from just a few years later by another cadet. And the, I mean, I was struck by the, drastically different social circumstances under which these uh, objects were produced. Uh, and in spite of that, the remarkably similar um, visual affect and trying to figure out sort of what is it about this um, means of description and communication that uh, that sort of rendered it useful from in each context, right? So, in West, at West Point, right, we're looking at training military engineers to uh, survey and control territory through military arms and fortifications. And it, nothing about that seems to uh, resonate with uh, Cage's uh, very aesthetic classroom space. Um, but the more I thought about it, it seemed like there was something about um, a sort of chaotic nature or a sort of a, the chaos in nature that needed to be sort of controlled or delimited or um, marked in some way. And I was wondering, Natalie, what you thought about that. I would say that there is a relationship, but I would say that it's really a kind of inverse one. Um, you know, uh, the New York School composers um, idea was to, in a way, deterritorialize staff notation as the prevailing diagram, the prevailing symbolic language of music composition, which in the face of new recording technologies, magnetic tape, and, and also an interest in noise as such, was not no longer capable of, of, of uh, properly inscribing the musical work as desired. So, um, in this case, the diagrams are are used to deterritorialize de uh, staff notation and really just every sort of prevailing convention around mu musical practice. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so so uh, this is and this is also responding to you know by Cage's moment a very um, strict performance culture around the conservatory. Uh, so it's it's no wonder that one would kind of go back to the basics and go to the very language of musical composition to try to attack um, attack those limitations. Um, but and I'll, I'll, the other thing I wanted to say is that at the same time, there was a sort of, um, there was an, a fan, I, I would call it a kind of fantasy uh, among these composers that by writing music or drawing music in this way, it would somehow get them closer to the materiality of sound. And for this, they were inspired actually by the fine arts. They were inspired by the New York School painters. So Pollock um, and uh, Rothko and de Kooning and, and so on. 
um, Morton Feldman in particular, um, they thought that this was a version of, of kind of sonic painting, that they were dealing directly with the material materiality of sound. Um, I wonder actually, could we go back to this distinction you were drawing between writing and drawing? Because um, that's one thing that comes up in my work actually is the way at a place like West Point, drawing is treated as a kind of universal language um, and it's given a grammar and a set of syntactical rules and um, deployed linguistically. And so um, to hear you sort of make this distinction between writing and drawing and one is, and you, you do it in the book as well, and this sort of shift from writing to drawing, I find that really interesting and want to know more about what's at stake for someone like Cage and then Machunas and Brecht um, in that distinction. I think it's, um, um, maybe I could put it this way, it's a, it's a desire to uh, achieve a kind of liberatory gesture, um, to move away from um, existing music, musical linguistic structures, to almost to, to achieve a kind of pre-symbolic relationship with music, that this was a kind of more raw way of composing. Um, I don't know if I can put it any any better than that. Um, it was it was an attempt to come up with new languages of, of how to how to write music. Um, I come back to this word again, perverse. There's something kind of perverse yeah. in thinking about this kind of aesthetic as liberatory, right? It's oh, sure. very much rooted in, I mean, it's rooted in mathematical notation and so yeah there's a, a very strange relationship there yeah cage is an endlessly complex figure um deserving of many books and many solo studies um, um one interesting thing about cage is that after this ser variation series it's almost as if he sees himself going too far and he actually shies away from this and he goes back to more conventional composing methods so but i highlight this moment because it to me it's the most radical um effort to deconstruct musical um musical notation and it becomes very influential unsurprisingly to a generation of visual artists who see these graphic scores as almost granting them permission to begin to use notation. And when I say notation, I mean in like the broadest possible way. Um, so um, in contrast to existing art, art historical studies that have focused on the linguistic qualities of fluxus event scores, my chapter on notation focuses on the really iconic visual graphic qualities of the scores, the diagrammatic qualities of the scores, the way that they articulate um, spatial relationships um, which to me corresponds with a kind of diagrammatic way of thinking that if you can sort of um, transform your thinking about artistic form away from something that is um, uh, kind of stilled and eternal, um, you know, if you think of you're making a painting, you're making a composition and it, you get it to be just so and it's finished, but with something like a conceptual structure, that the event score affords, you have a set of relationships that are more flexible, or more flexible, more topological, almost more like crystalline, that the interpreter or the performer can actually play with. Um, so, you know, here's just a, a, a kind of smattering of different diagrammatic scores that do come out of the fluxus moment that I think um, my book was trying to draw greater attention to rather than the sort of strict um, uh, lang uh, text based ones. Mm -hmm. um, so moving, oh, moving forward to the project. So then um, one of the things that I realized in the research is that there was a kind of untold story about Fluxus's relationship to painting, which begins with George Breck's event scores and all of their drips but actually coincides with a series of interesting drawings that George Machunas makes where he drops India ink onto wet paper and thereby the materials uh, sort of self-generate automatically, autonomously, all of these really beautiful bleeds. Um, and Brecht himself was making a series of what he called chance paintings where he would take a bed sheet, he would wet it, he would crumple it up and then he would drip pigment onto it um, a kind of tie-dye basically, um, but it was a sort of automatically generated painting. Um, and 
this was very much inspired by, you know, Jackson Pollock's or paintings, Alfonso Osorio, also an abstract expressions painter of that moment. Um, but Fluxus had been historicized as this like really anti-modernist, anti-painting movement. And I realized that no, actually they did make paintings, um, but they just had a different sort of approach uh, to that gesture. And it wasn't an expressionistic gesture. It wasn't about this heroic self gesture. It became an expressionism of chance and almost of radical blindness where the artist would uh, kind of come up with a set of procedures, set up a material situation and let it unfold of its own accord. So it was a kind of like materialist autonomy of materials. Um, and what really kind of sealed the deal for me in terms of like, I have to write about this was that, you know, through the wonders of uh, text data mining, I discovered that Alfonso Osorio actually painted a painting called Fluxus in 1956, that was displayed at the Whitney Museum in their um, annual exhibition. And this had been nowhere recorded in the Fluxus scholarship. So I'm very proud that I was able to unearth this historical detail. There's a beautiful color plate of Osorio's painting. I also helped correct the gallery's um, mis mis or confusion about the orientation of the painting. <laughs> because they thought that it was supposed to be the other way around. So um, all of the wonders of research um, came together in this chapter. And then I also was able to get uh, one of my photo students at University of Houston, Terry Garcia, to go to MoMA and get the perfect uh, Jackson Pollock detail that I wanted to juxtapose with this so that you could really see that even in Pollock's painting, there is already this almost like osmotic uh, movement of material of, of pigment over the canvas that I think um, was really captivating uh, to Fluxus artists. And it's in this chapter that I carry forward um, a sort of Deleuzian engagement with the diagram that is thinking about um, materials as having a kind of um, imminent diagram that like if you think of liquid and its atomic structure, this is a sort of very physical um, atomic level set of structures that um, uh, uh, influence the way liquid behaves, that there's a sort of diagram within materials themselves that uh, give us certain forms. I was uh, struck when I was reading this, this chapter in particular, I found incredibly helpful for my own work and there are scribbles all over it, um, notes that I need to return to and places that I want to think about more. One thing um, that I kept thinking about is the way this relationship between the diagram and material is um, bidirectional. So that it, um, I'm frequently working with diagrams that seek to exceed, that seek to become sort of performative, that sort of unpack themselves. Um, I wonder, would you mind turning to the next yeah. slide? So I was, I've been thinking about this opening uh, a lot recently and the way in which the, the act of turning the page of reading the book enacts the kind of, enacts the, the process of printing it, through which the book is made manifest. And it seems like I was just, amazed to find within Fluxus it, the same idea about a kind of particular material forms having their own direction sort of built into them, right? their own set of instructions. Right? The, the act of opening the book, um, which is a sort of almost preternatural act, right? what do you do with a book but open it? And through doing that, we are brought into the process of printing that we are learning about through the, the visual materials. And that seemed to be to, to be this through line into the Fluxus object um, and sort of beyond, sort of rooted in the abstract expressionist painting, but sort of carried through to the assemblages and other sorts of objects that were made uh, sort of under the rubric of Fluxus. There's not yeah, a question. Absolutely. <laughs> Do you want to talk about this one too? Um, I mean, this is another one where I, I, it just felt like um, 
I've always been, I, since I found this uh, in the British patent rules, I've been terrified by it and <laughs> um, quite struck by it, but the way in which the, the draftsman had sort of unpacks and unfurls this object while still maintaining a, a connection with its quite threatening purpose, right? You're staring straight down the barrel. Um, and it's, it seemed to me to be connected to the ways in which fluxus objects sort of carry with them their own intended purposes. Right. And, uh, apart from any sort of extra textual directions. Absolutely. Um, this is where the diagram to me is endlessly fascinating because of its, um, as you say, projective qualities and that there's a, there, there are some kinds of diagrams that, um, seem almost to enact themselves. Um, I think this is part of um, Fluxus's interest in um, diagrammatic forms. Um, by chapter three, I begin to talk about um, George Breck's sculptural assemblages, his use of ready-made objects under this idea of the notate, what I call the notational object. So there's a point at which the event score as the separate text kind of um, falls away and you have the creation of objects that um, through their sort of quotidian uh, kind of commonly understood use value, they just have an implied use or an implied participatory quality where you no longer need it, explicitly a text. And this begins uh, is where in the book we shift towards a focus on these game-like kits, the fluxus objects, um, which I love this photograph of George, George Machunas's photograph of the many fluxus editions that he helped to publish. Um, which shows them, shows just how tactile they're intended to be splayed out across this horizontal surface and you're meant to really be immersed in them as objects and you, you're meant to like be sort of um, involved with them. And um, I talk about how they had an integral relationship to the earliest Flexus concerts as objects that you could purchase almost like as a souvenir during intermission of the Fluxus concerts, as you see in this Peter Moore photograph of 1965. Um, and they were very intermedial involving scores, but also sometimes film loops, um, sculptural objects, um, self-destructing objects like this Ben Vautier Max matchbox that asks you to use the match to destroy destroy all art museums and art objects and then at last destroy the object itself. Um, so very playful, very witty. Um, and, you know, even to the point of objects that almost invite, uh, don't almost, they literally invite bodily incorporation. So Ben Vautier's flux holes um, that invite you to put your body in them or put things through the holes. Larry Miller's orifice flux plugs. Um, which are things to put into or insert into your body. Machunas's collection of various um, forms of animal poop, which I call a wunderkammer of poop in the book. Um, and this sort of parallels what I talk about as an expansive fluxus model of subjectivity, uh, where the relationship between author, publisher, participant gets really blurred. Um, and where I see a kind of musical ontology of, you know, composer, performer, audience being kind of imported into the realm of the, this fluxus fine art milieu. Um, so in this Vautier image, you have Ben Vautier's prototype that he offered to Machunas, and then you have all of the versions that Machunas then published. And you can see that a work like this really frustrates ideas we might have about additioning um, where every time you open up this so-called edition of flux holes, you don't know what you're getting <laughs> necessarily. So there, these editions were unnumbered, um, unlimited. Sometimes it was unclear who the author actually was. Maybe there wasn't even a name on it. And they were also internally varied. So they exist very in this very complicated position between you know, unique single authored fine art objects and editions, which are traditionally, of course, like signed, numbered, they're approved by the artist and highly legislated. And these don't really operate uh, fully according to either model. And um, this was, of course, um, I would say very deliberate and part of this kind of expansive notion of fluxus subjectivity. Here you have Machunas playing 
with Miller's orifice flux plugs and other versions of kind of um, bodily incorporation that you that I found um, in fluxus material archives. Ben Patterson's Please Wash Your Face, IO's finger box that you stick your finger in, more Vautier flux holes, and Shigeko Kubota's flux medicine that you would um, supposedly ingest. I want to peel back the curtain on our sort of pre interview or pre conversation conversation because um, we were talking about in our um, earlier in the week it, the the role of the body in these objects and how present the body is in the sort of subject matter of many of these so Vautier's um, flux holes depicting various bodily orifices that need to be filled or not. Um, the sort of set of objects for filling <laughs> said ob said orifices, um, and so how does the one of my questions is sort of how does fluxus or how do the various practitioners practitioners of fluxus imagine that body? Do they imagine it to be their own? Is there a sort of generic generic body that they are imagining? Sort of how do how do they relate? to the body, particularly um, potentially non-normative bodies? This is a, a tough question to approach. Um, you know, on the one hand, I like to celebrate Fluxus as an incredibly diverse artist collective for its moment. So you have um, women members like Alison Knowles, you have uh, women participants coming from Japan uh, to New York specifically to be involved in Fluxus, like Amiko Shiomi or Shigeko Kubota. You also have um, Benjamin Patterson, an African American participant who um, has been uh, recently um, revived and celebrated through the work of folks like George Lewis. Um, and yet, despite um, all of these kind of marked identities that we see within the Fluxus milieu, I actually would argue that the performer. Um, as written, you know, through the Fluxus scores, it's actually deliberately kind of anonymized, and there's a kind of desubjectivizing uh, quality to the scores. And if you look even at the, um, uh, if we go back to like the early um, performances, this kind of Fluxus uniform of like the almost like the organization man or the man in the gray flannel suit. Um, I think this is deliberate. Um, and it is a kind of um, a sort of indication that anybody can perform these pieces, but also a sort of critical response to the kind of legislating um, of bodies. And I, I, I think that there's an, there's an interest among the artists in, in the kind of friction between this sort of neutral empty score and then appreciating the way in which it becomes particularized in each performance so that the performance itself could be marked by categories of race or gender, but the actual score as a composition um, does not carry that with it uh, on a fundamental level. Um, I know I know some Fluxus scholars would maybe argue against that. Um, there are certain works by someone like Benjamin Patterson, for example, like Please Wash Your Face, that really beg to be read um through a kind of critical race art art history um and i think that's absolutely fair but i would maybe side with the this sort of like playful utopian idea that these scores are really meant um for anybody to embody them if that answers your question thank you um we are past time to turn over to yeah we are Q &A. um i mean i have i could go on and on and discussing this book with you um but i want to make sure that other people have the chance so oh can i share though um actually related to that i did put one slide on that i wanted to share maybe to provoke other scholars to kind of pick this up but one of the cool things that i found this was just one of these things that happens when you spend a lot of time with materials in an archive um i noticed that there was uh, a visual conversation happening between this George Brecht edition called Closed on Mondays, which is a box that's actually glued shut, so you can't open it. 
Um, and this photograph that George Machunas took of Flux's people at the Flux's headquarters, the street events photograph, which actually is taken indoors. <laughs> and so I say that they're wearing heavy coats because they're in a Soho loft with no heating in the wintertime. Um, but then just by happenstance, because I love this album by um, Ornette Pullman, I was, I sort of, it was struck, striking to me this visual similarity between this um, album that uh, Coleman released in 1970 with this photograph of these two kids in front of his artist house, Prince Street performance space and this visual conversation happening in Fluxus. And then um, I came to realize that the building in which artist's house was located was one of the many Soho developments that George Machunas helped renovate and make available to artists. So one, among many of Machunas's um, contributions to art history is as the so-called father of Soho, who was involved in kind of generating this whole category of the artist loft. Um, but this is something that I, it's a footnote in the book and I wish that, um, um, well, I want to spin it out into something else, but I wanted to insert that here. Funny because I had my own kind of footnote like that, um, reading through, I guess, Yoko Ono performed at 112 Chamber Street uh, at some point, and I worked at an architecture office at 111 um, for several <laughs> years. That's part of where I got my sort of training in diagrams and drawing, and um, so I had my own kind of geographic moment. <laughs> I think to this book. So um, yeah, I think maybe we should turn it over to the rest of the audience. And I guess um, Elizabeth Yale is going to moderate our chat for us. Yes, thank you, Natalie and Elizabeth. That was just so fascinating. And I have a lot of questions too. Um, please do, all of you who are out there, please do feel free to post questions in the chat and we'll continue the conversation. Um, I see that there's a question from Alan. Um, Alan asks, what is the eternal network? who, what are the heirs of Fluxus in existence today? Yes, good question. So that was the term and the title that, that we didn't quite get to. Um, chapter five in the book is focused greatly on the French Fluxus uh, participant, Robert Filiou, who comes up with the idea of the eternal network. Um, Phil Yu is an artist who comes to uh, the realm of the visual arts through poetry. I'm just trying to find an image so you can see him. Um, there he is at the bottom left in Villefranche-sur-Mer with George Brecht. Uh, Phil Yu and Brecht opened a bookshop in this little seaside village adjacent to Nice um, called La Sadie qui sourit, the Sadia that smiles. Um, and Phil Yu, he was a poet. He was also trained as an economist. He has an MA um, in economics from UCLA. Um, and he was involved in the kind of post-Korean War reconstruction efforts with the UN. So very interesting man um, who also develops a very kind of wacky set of political philosophies and economic philosophies. Um, and one of them is this idea of the, the eternal network. And it's a really a kind of conceptual provocation um, where he argues that the eternal network is, it's a kind of analog for fluxus. For him, it's this um, international network of like-minded artists kind of working in tandem. And this is his way of sort of poetically proposing that uh, the fluxus collective knows no bounds. It has no center and that it will um, kind of continue on as long as um, people are making work wherever they are. Um, it's a term that was picked up by later generations of male artists in the 1970s and beyond, M-A-I-L artists, um, <laughs> correspondence artists, um, and uh, has become more associated with the tradition of male art. But um, I located, um, I, in, you know, with its origins with Phil Yu and a lot of his um, artworks that were indeed distributed by mail through this, um, this shop that he and Brecht ran in Villefranche. But if you have, if you have a follow-up question, I'd be happy to answer it. Um, our Arvid Nelson asks also a question kind of thinking about how Fluxus might have evolved or impacted subsequent movements. I wonder if you have thoughts about the impact of Fluxus, these objects, and the democratizing rhetorics on later projects. 
Physically, I'm reminded of projects like the X Art Foundation's Blast Editions and in Democratizing Art, I see traces in journals like Esopus and McSweeney's. Yeah, I totally agree. And I'm glad that you're seeing those parallels. One of the contemporary phenomena that makes me happiest to see is um, events like Printed Matters art book fairs and the incredible um, kind of efflorescence of interest in artist books by like young hip kids, like my students. <laughs> they, want, they want actual books, they want things in print they want zines. Um, and as a young person who was innately attracted to books and pages and printed things, but also interested in performance and music, I too was sort of magnetically drawn to Fluxus. And this book was my way of really clarifying the intellectual history and the historical stakes of Fluxus. So, the conclusion of the book really brings us to the very present. I reflect on a 2008 exhibition that I witnessed at SFMOMA called The Art of Participation, which starts with Fluxus, but then ends with um, computer art, basically. And I, uh, it was a great exhibition, but I was really kind of horrified or disturbed by this historical trajectory because everything that I had learned about Fluxus from spending time in these archives, and I should say also um, from talking with the artists and spending time with them, um, Allison Knowles, Benjamin Patterson, that Fluxus, it was about connectivity, it was about the international network, but it was really, it wasn't about that. It didn't live in that sort of virtual space. Um, it was about like doing the thing, <laughs> doing the score <laughs> with the people around you and with the things at hand and, and that the conflation of fluxus with internet art or some idea of the virtual was just to me felt deeply wrong. Um, so I would just, I wanted to emphasize in that last chapter that um, fluxus is about the here and now. And even if we look at works by Namjoon Paik, um, who's often uh, held up as this pro, pro uh, pre-internet art fluxus person, his work with technology like was always very bodily, very critical, um, sometimes very nihilistic <laughs> um, in its relationship to TV as a technology. Um, so I'm all about the materiality of the printed page. I love that one on the lower left in the corner with the candles inside the, the box of the television. Um, if I may ask a question, I just have so many. Um, I think one of the things that I find really striking about all the images that you show Natalie is that there are all these photographs of artists in conversation with each other that I wish I could just jump into and kind of you know hear that conversation and be a part of that. They just come across so vividly, right? Visually, like you can almost feel the, the activity buzzing off of the photo. Um, I wonder, we were talking a little bit right before the session started about how you teach with these materials. Um, and it sounded almost like you had that kind of approach of, of inviting your students in to be part of the art, to be part of almost the movement itself. Um, and I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit more about how you find this resonates with your students and how you approach teaching them about, teaching them about these materials. Sure. Um, well, first of all, you have to do it. So even though we're too cool for school and embarrassed and uncomfortable, I make them perform things. And there are, you know, a lot of pieces that are that don't ask that much of you. So if all you can bear to do is sit still for four minutes and 33 seconds, great, you can perform John Cage's silent piece. Um, Yoko Ono has this beautiful piece where you simply light a match and you watch it go out. And then there are more kind of radical things like the kick and the screaming piece. So that is the first one. Um, the second thing is that I um, have built up really great relationships with um, the librarians at U of H, at the William Jenkins Art Library, Catherine Essinger, um, props to her, and also with John Evans at the Hirsch Library at the MFAH. I'm sorry, I'm trying to find my teaching images. Um, and I bring students into uh, these collections. Here we go. So this is at the UH Library. So I've consulted with the librarians about things that they can purchase that are affordable that our students can interact with and then I also keep an eye on very contemporary publications 
and try to help them very concretely see the relationships between 1960s publication practices and the very you know, vibrant community of artists um, uh, publishing today. Uh, these photographs are from the Hirsch Library, which also has a budding Fluxus collection, but also wonderfully as well, kind of Latin American um, avant-garde collection. So the, the eternal network is really able to come alive when you see um, an artist name who's associated with Fluxus, but then they're also in this other journal and that other journal. Um, and it's impossible to adequately explain or show in PowerPoint. So you just have to bring the students to the library and, and put them in front of the objects. And I have to say, um, doing this project brought me to Rare Book School, which I'm so happy about. I, I'm not trained in book history at all, but doing this um, project turned me into a book collector <laughs> because the the archive and the artwork in Fluxus are really one and the same, which is kind of taken for granted among book scholars, I imagine, but it's not the case with art historians. You know, normally we can't own the paintings that we work on because they're just, they're blue chip objects, we can't own them. But one of the wonderful things about Fluxus is that you can. So um, I also pluck things off of my own shelves and there are great publishers like Primary Information and New Documents who are re-editioning some of the, the rarer out of print things. Um, so now I can have my fancy copy in my bookshelf and then I can also bring out the republished copy and let my students put their fingers all over it um, and everyone everyone's happy. <laughs> That's very cool. And we've had a question in the chat from Jessica. She writes, while visiting various archives and museums to study Fluxus works they hold, did you gather information on their approaches to exhibiting materials that only reveal themselves through interaction or participation? Yeah, I would say just over the years, I have um, encountered various best practices in terms of exhibiting uh, Fluxus materials. Um, as you rightly point out, there is the problem of the display case issue where, you know, we have to put these things behind glass because they're precious and we want to take care of them. And I am all for that. Um, I've seen really great um, successful efforts to make copies of works that can be interacted with. So the, the, the GRI has done this. Um, the Walker also has involved artists as a way of, of making these works accessible. Um, so they commissioned the artist Christian Markley to interact with their Fluxus collection. And that produced an artwork, which is a video. Um, and it uh, anticipates the unboxing videos of our YouTube age. And you basically see Christian Markley's white gloved hands and he's uh, unboxing the Fluxus objects, but also like sonically activating them. So he shakes things and um, this was also uh, um, an approach taken by uh, the Quintal of Bielefeld when they did a Machuna show. They basically made a bunch of kind of unboxing videos for Fluxus. And, and to me, that was a pretty good approach. So you at least virtually have the experience of watching someone else engage with the objects. Um, currently, I'm involved in a digital publication project with the GRI uh, that's focused on this really broad period of experimental notation from the 1950s through the 70s. And we are developing a number of digital approaches to making this work accessible. And some of this is going to involve um, kind of 3D manipulation of objects. We are reproducing the entirety of Water Yam and I've keyworded all of the cards and they'll be digitized in relative scale. Um, and you can sort of shuffle through them and learn about their interconnections. Um, so th it, there's definitely still room for new ideas and innovations. Thankfully, by now we have an array of approaches on the curatorial record. Mm -hmm. yeah. Elizabeth, did you have any final questions? You know, I, um, Jessica's question makes me sort of comes around to, I guess my final thought is that Natalie's work and um, these materials themselves, I think, seem, as I said at the outset, incredibly instructive for our work um, in critical bibli bibliography, sort of forcing us to grapple with the way in which not just these sort of problematic objects, but um, sort of the codex might also uh, 
require new and different approaches um, when we start thinking about it in terms of the kind of indeterminacy and ambiguity that um, fluxus objects bring to the fore. Yeah, very cool. Well, I want to um, thank you, Natalie, and thank you, Elizabeth, for participating um, in such a lively conversation today to celebrate Natalie's book. Um, I think, Natalie, at the very beginning of the presentation, you shared with us a discount code that the publisher had made available. Um, for those who are participating in the event today, maybe we could just throw that up um, on the screen at the very end um, for those who maybe missed it at the very beginning. Um, and I want to thank you all for joining us today. Um, thank you to RBS and the RBS staff um, for uh, pulling the event together um, and bringing us together today. And just a note that in the chat, there's a quick note about when the recording will be available um, of our conversation today. And just a note about the RBS summer 2021 course schedule, if that's something that you are interested in taking a look at or have questions about. Um, Thank you again uh, to Natalie to, and to Elizabeth. And for my end, a big round of applause for a fantastic book. Thank you for being with us today. It's been a pleasure. Flux on. Indeed. <laughs>